it, something couldn't work out from that type of a situation. At least get to know people out in the area where you think you want to live and something can work out from that. Let's say city life versus rural life. Um, why is it? Why would it might be better to live in the in the country? Just quality of life. I mean, I, I don't know how many times, a thousand times, you know, since moving out here, um, we've talked to people and and they love it. I mean, we've never looked back. Um, I don't hear sirens. You know, there's very little crime. Uh, park the car. You leave your keys in it so somebody can move it if they need to, or fill it with zucchini squash. And you want to lock your car in the fall, you know, because you can get it stuffed full of zucchini. <laughs> but um, you know, things like that are just, you know, how, what do you pay for that? You know, when we lived in Colorado, I mean, you, you couldn't let your kids go outside. They might, you know, bust you for homeschooling, or or they couldn't ride their bikes in the neighborhood because they might get shot or they might get hit up by a drug dealer. Um, out here. There's none of that going on. I mean, there's drugs everywhere, but my children, grandkids, they can go out whenever they want, wherever they want, play in a pasture, go climb trees, look for herbs, ride their bikes down the street, go sledding down the street, you know, whatever they want to do. Um, want to go out and go target practicing. Uh, it, you know, you're free to do whatever you want to do. Just a lot better quality of life, a lot safer, um, a lot better, you know, moral environment. Uh, just any number of, of, I can't think of any downside to living in a rural environment versus a city environment, unless you just really want to live in a city environment. I mean, but I never did. Um, a good example of, of living rural as opposed to living in the city, um, during the Depression, a lot of people in the Ozarks, we, we moved here and I'd start talking to neighbors, one just a couple of miles from here. He said people during the Depression didn't know there was a depression until afterwards. The news didn't hit them. And they were like, oh really? Um, that's too bad. Uh, another guy said, you know, the reason was because people here were poor, but they had their goats, they had their chickens, they had their garden, they had a milk cow. And we just talked a little bit uh, about, you know, with food and raiment, well, people here had their cabin and they had their food and they were happy. And the oppression did not affect them. Some people were better off during the Depression than before because they, uh, their food was worth more. And not too far from here, just about 20 miles from us, uh, there was a woman who took in boarders from the city. And during that period of time, she uh, would put them up for 50 cents a week. They, they paid less at her farm than they, it cost them to live in the city. They got better food. They had work. They had a safe place to stay. And with that 50 cents a week, she bought a thousand acres of land, okay? So she was better off during the Depression. <laughs> the Depression got her a thousand acres of land. Yeah. Why people can't see this plain view concept? Well, I would say primarily it's, again, um, conditioning, uh, brainwashing, you know, the, the society we live in, we, we have, think we have to have a certain type of house, we have to have a certain way of living. Um, and I just think we need to break free of that and get out of that. Um, examples of food, water, housing, and plain view. Um, the food, uh, you know, is, is in a lot of the areas of the country, there is food everywhere. And this is one thing that a lot of people, uh, my grandchildren, are learning is going out in the woods and, and finding edible food, lamb's quarters and, and uh, you know, plantain is edible, uh, comfrey. And not only are a lot of these herbs edible, but they're very healing, very powerfully healing. I made the statement one time, I was at a meeting, it was uh, actually the Well-Fed Neighbor Alliance uh, first annual picnic. And I made this statement to one guy about, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of people gonna be coming here into this region. And boy, the fire was in his eyes. He said, do you have any idea how fast starvation sets in? And I made the exact same statement just a few minutes later to a different man. And he said, well, of course, we have food everywhere here. Every broadleaf plant is food, 
We just need to eat it and you know, can chew it, juice it, whatever. I mean, we have food everywhere. So that's an example of food. Um, shelter wise, uh, you know, we, we need, you need shelter. We don't need to live in a McMansion. We can build a shelter out of many things. Um, uh, I looked at a soccer ball and I, I saw that all the lines on it are straight lines. So I designed a geodesic dome that was, doesn't have hubs uh, in the traditional sense of a geodesic dome. Food, uh, water, well, water is, at least in some regions, there's pl it's plentiful. Uh, I'm from Colorado. You could walk for three days without water. Here in Missouri, you walk for three minutes. You're going to find a stream. You're going to find a pond, you know. Um, it's just, you know, we need to know how to, I guess in plain view, it would be, you know, learning how to filter it. You know, build a fire, build some, you know, get, burn some, char some oak down, make charcoal, get your handkerchief, and make a water filter. Make a tripod of sticks and pour water in it. You got clean water. So there's a, there's always a way to do things that is an alternate way to the traditional way of doing things. Well, I need to pay three hundred dollars for a really fancy filter. Well, you can make one too. <laughs> so that was kind of a, a concept that I uh, the, the phraseology I picked up on there was a survival course uh, when I was in Denver, and that was the title of the course in plain view. And it was like, uh, here's 59 things you can do with a pack of cigarettes. In other words, there's a, the, the filter you can tear off and you can make a, the base of a dart out of for a blowgun. The tobacco you can soak in water and use as a poison to hunt with. So, you know, a lot of different things like that. Um, <clears throat> so, in plain view, it's like, what do you have at hand? Make use of it. Uh, a really good example is there's a saying, in, in, uh, it applies to building a home, building a shelter. Um, and I believe we're going to be seeing more and more. We are right now, just an explosion of alternative housing methodologies, you know, earth bag, uh, free round, you know, round earth and compressed earth block and on and on, cordwood and everything. So what that the basic idea there is, look out the window or look outside. Why can't people get that idea across in plain view? Again, uh, I'd, I'd say it in one word, brainwashing. I mean, we're brainwashed into a consumerism type of a mentality. Um, we have to have a certain kind of house. It has to be a certain mansion quality, McMansion. Um, that's going to cost a lot of people a lot more than their houses. Uh, we need to be in a mindset where we make use of what we have at hand, you know, um, in plain view. Why do we need to uh, think outside the box? Well, the, um, uh, with what we're going to be faced with, in my estimation, um, a lot of difficult situations, um, I believe we're going to need to in order to you know, make it through. Um, for instance, uh, I mentioned um, two rotors and a rocket stove, um, to make a rocket stove out of that. You know, what do you have at hand? Uh, what materials do you have? Make do with them somehow or another. If you need a sharp instrument, uh, a broken glass bottle, you know, uh, sharpen a bone, you know, just any number of ways to come up with a solution. I'd say probably a thousand times in the last few years, I'll tell my son to go get, get me something, a tool. And he knows, I say a day late, he goes, and a dollar short. You know, because by the time he's back, I have already found what I needed that worked well enough. I needed a hammer, I needed a screwdriver, I needed a whatever, boom. And before he gets back with the right tool, I've already done what I needed to do. So um, yeah, that, that's, that's one thing. You know, so that's where we need to be, is to be able to make use of the things we have at hand that are, that are in plain view. Um, thinking outside the box is uh, we're, we're conditioned to think a certain way. We have to have a normal job. We have to have a, a house. We have to have insurance. <coughs> and, um, and, and you can apply thinking outside the box to any number of situations. Um, you you want to have heat. Does it have to be electric? Does it have to be propane or whatever? I mean, I designed a, uh, an in-ground rocket stove. It's a way to heat the ground. You're using the earth as thermal mass, and you can, you know, sleep on the earth. This is for a camping situation, survival situation. Um, 
another uh, instance, I took a couple brake rotors and put a, put them in between a piece of tube steel, made a rocket stove out of that. Works great, you know. Um, we need to we need to learn to think outside the box, and, and it's a it's hard to do. It's just something that you have to force, condition, discipline yourself to do. Uh, I guess it's unusual enough that after I spoke one time, this guy came up to me and he says, "You're, you know, you're amazing." He said, "You, you, you think outside the box." And I went, "Well, so." And he goes, "I'm a psychiatrist." He said, "If you had any idea," he said, "That's what I spend my life doing, is trying to get people to think outside the box." So it's, it's not easy to do, I, you know, I guess. But um, that's one thing that, in order to make it through some of the situations I believe we're going to be facing, we need to, we need to be able to learn to do that. One. Okay. Um, more and more people are learning about rocket stoves, and the, the concept is when you increase the exhaust draw, the heat of the exhaust draw. Mm, uh, okay. In a, in a cooking situation, <laughs> this is a Aprovecia rocket stove. It's got a ceramic core, <clears throat> so it gets hot and you burn, you got a hot, lot higher burn ratio, burn combustion ratio. Uh, instead of uh, putting wood on a fire and getting 40% um, of the BTUs that's available in that wood turned into cooking heat, um, you're getting more like 90 to 100%. And less smoke inhalation, lot, you know, there's a million women and children die every year around the world because of smoke inhalation cooking inside in bad weather. So. Um, in a heating situation, a rocket stove is designed to heat thermal mass. And so what I did was, um, and I've done this once before, uh, down in Oklahoma one time, from start to finish, I just designed this out in my head, and my son and I started digging, and one hour later we were sitting there uh, eating dinner that we cooked on a rocket stove. What it is, is an in-ground rocket stove, or you could call it a trench rocket stove. There is a... Um, uh, a way of cooking a kind of a stealth camping situation that's called a Dakota fire hole. And what that is is you dig a hole down here and you dig a hole down here and you build your fire down in there and you cook over this and you feed it from this side. <clears throat> and so uh, it, it basically is it's an in-ground rocket stove. And when I saw that I was like, hmm, so let's make a device that can do that. Um, and you could, you could do this just in the ground, but what I did with here was I've got an elbow Okay, here's a six inch stovepipe elbow. Here's a, a T, a six inch T. And so the elbow goes in to the T and then it goes into piping and, um, and, it, and it exhaust outside. Point was, is it, and it worked awesome. Um, uh, you can sleep on it. Say so your thermal mass is, you know, I'm not paying anything for thermal mass. I dug a hole in the ground. I put the pipe in it, I put the dirt back on it. Now, if you notice all this stuff here, um, I actually did this for a permanent installation so I can stay out here whenever I want to um, get away from things, shall we say. Um, I've got a plastic liner, I've got aluminum foil, I've got some scrap insulation that we had laying around from, it put, pulled out of a construction site, where a, or not a construction site, but a, an old house that was being torn down. <clears throat> and then um, cover that with dirt, and so you fire it up, you cook dinner, do whatever, uh, let's say it's 30 degrees outside, or let's say, let's say it's zero. But when you want to sleep, you sleep on the warm earth. You've got thermal mass there. Now, the trench we dug in a parabolic shape, so it's, you know, reflective, or, you know, the, like an antenna type of a thing. I dug it in a parabolic shape and lined it, let's say, with insulation, with water, bar you know, water barrier, the plastic, and then the insulation. So all of the thermal mass that I put on this is going to reflect upward and I'm not going to be heating the, the ground as much. Um, and that's just something I got from uh, standard rocket stoves, this uh, uh, construction guy, you know, will insulate it, you know. Don't heat the ground and don't heat the wall. Insulate it so it reflects in, and that's what I did here. So, there you go. Um, the, uh, now, I wish I had, uh, if I had this done, I wanted, to be able to, I wanted people to be able to see this so I didn't finish it up, but in the first one I did, you know, this would be your, um, Here's where you put your firewood. 
okay? Then you're gonna cook on this one. And then I also had, um, I could build this up and put a five gallon bucket over that or even a 20 gallon drum and then stack rocks and, you know, pack cob around it if it's, a, you know, if I was gonna be here for a while. I could actually make a, a real combustion chamber rocket stove. As it was, the one I did this before, it worked perfectly. I mean, you could see like flame like that going sideways here, you know, put your uh, wood in here, sideways flame because the draw is created outside. I start a fire out there and then I light this one. That heats up the exhaust stack and then it um, creates a suction and so you have no smoke in here. This could be a Walmart tent. This could be a $50 Walmart tent. You could cook in here, have heat, sleep on warm ground, and have um, everything you need to stay warm and cozy in here with no smoke. And your smoke's outside. Now, when a rocket stove is fired up and working at full burn, there's no smoke outside either. So you've got kind of a stealth um, situation. And we can maybe get a shot of that a little bit later. So there you go. <coughs> Good? From the Rockies one time. And, oh my gosh. You know, it was 30 below. We were up camping with some friends and one of the, I, it was one of the two times I've heard someone say this statement. And this was the most beautiful time in the, in the, this is the most beautiful time to be camping, you know, when it's 30 below out. Because it's, uh, the stars are glittering and the ice crystals are in the air and it's just so beautiful. And that was a, a woman that said that, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway. We sat around a sitting around a campfire, and I uh, it was so it was a nice big boring campfire, and I actually I remember un, unzipping my coveralls, and I had Air Force flight coveralls and whatnot, and so my son Ian, he's all roasty toasty, cozy warm, and he goes to bed, and then uh, my daughters, both Anna and my daughter Susie and I, we sat up yakking, and by the time we went to bed, we were getting we were having hypothermia, so <laughs> it uh, that was I, I learned that you know, get warm, go to bed. Get warm, get in your sleeping bag, and that's what Ian did. Our two survival situations, he slept through. Smart kid. Um. Probably about seven, I'm guessing. I don't quite remember. Get it going a little bit better. Yep. That was the first time I made a teepee too. I just made a teepee with tarps and stuff, and it was it was not a good <coughs> it was not a cool configuration. <laughs> anyway, yep. So Needed a little bit more fuel at hand. That stuff. And the, the other thing, too, is when I first did this, it scared me. I was like, I, I, I shut it down because I was, it, it, the first time it fired up, I thought it was going to melt this steel. It was going so much. The first one I built years ago. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Anyway, so listen to that. <laughs> you wonder why they call it a rocket stove? <laughs> That's why. Whoa. Ah. This is not. 
I'm just trying to get two of them on there to get more draft. But that's why they call them rocket stoves, because they sound like a rocket. There we go. Dig a trench and boom, you know. <laughs> paper there anyway and then you get it burning and it's sucking the it just burns the bottom off the twigs My tirade. <laughs> Am I looking still over at the chair? Um, yeah, look at it. <coughs> oh, all right, so George Washington and the Anyway, it's, it's the whole, um, question <clears throat> of what is going to pertain in a major breakdown in this country and the relationship of that to a, a, a safe place. The, uh, for, a long, for many, many years, I, I, I've felt that uh, if and when, <clears throat> in my estimation, when, you know, judgment happens, comes to pass in America, that God would reserve a place for, you know, his people to be. Uh, when, when the plagues, when, when judgment fell on Egypt, uh, the first of the plagues affected the Israelites as well as the people of Egypt. But then, as uh, they progressed, they did not affect the Israelites. Where were the Israelites? They were in a separate part of the country in the, in the midst of Egypt, uh, the land of Goshen. And the plagues did not affect them. And I've always, I began, and this has been an evolving, if you, not a good, great word to use, but you know, kind of an evolving position. <clears throat> so I felt that. And as time went on, I met um, and talked to people who said, well, we need to be, be able to grow food. Well, what a, what a thought. You know, we need to go to where it, you're able to grow food, and that's the breadbasket of America. You know, from uh, Lubbock, Texas, to Atlanta, Georgia, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to Scottsbluff, Nebraska. That's the center part of the country, and that's the breadbasket. How big that part, how big that region ends up being depends on how many good people come in there to hold it. Okay. <clears throat> and then when we left Denver, we started hearing about people that we knew who left Denver before us who had moved. And that was a lot of people. Uh, virtually every week someone was disappearing. You'd call them up. That number's been disconnected in the long-run service. We did the same thing. We just poof left. And um, so I started putting on a, a Rand McNally Atlas, you know, a Con US, Continental US map in the middle, uh, road map of the whole country. And I had so many dots on that map at one point that I just drew a circle on it. It was a literal circle. And from that day to this, that, that size and shape of that has never changed. I, you know, I'm coming to see more and more 
those people who we knew in Denver had left had been led to move to the Ozark Plateau. <clears throat> and so um, as I, you know, learned more and more, I heard stories like, well, Corey Ten Boom was on a plane, you know, plane flight over the Midwest and she looked out the window and had this vision of a circular region, mostly in Missouri, Southwest Missouri, and a um, wall of fire around it and angels five ranks deep and inside everything was green and the cattle were grazing and goats were, you know, children were playing and uh, outside everything was desolation, chaos, anarchy, you know, um, invade, you know, war and everything else. And it was really neat one time I, I stepped outside here and uh, and I heard something and I, oh, that's the grandkids out there playing. And the, and the pasture was green and the, you know, some cattle were out there grazing and I was like, awesome. You know, just to, to see that, you know, um, experience that in, in my own life, you know, at, at least we're, where we have green pasture growing and uh, goats and cattle grazing out there and, and grandchildren playing out there. So, um, but yeah, a circular region has never ever um, uh, changed the size or anything there. And so, you know, you combine that with um, what I see 